and uh, across a multitude of states in New England, and it's really a reunion uh, for me and, and just about everybody that's here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time today, so uh, I'm going to move right along. Um, without kind of rehashing a lot of the details, um, Jim found himself caught up in a, a point shaving scheme at Boston College uh, back in the summer of 1978. That's at least when it was conceived by gamblers that were out of Pittsburgh that had close ties to one of his teammates. Um, I think it's been well documented. It's been over 35 years or close to 35 years now. Um, if you want to find out more about the specifics, you know, you can just Google it. Um, there is a 30 for 30 ESPN documentary. There was a cover story on SI years and years ago, which um, was just told uh, basically an exclusive story given to one of the um, supposed mobsters that was involved at the time. Um, so I don't want to eat up a lot of time in, in going back over that. Um, I think that's, that's been well documented and it's just a chance for, I think, uh, Jim and his wife to, to talk about how it's impacted them. But uh, why don't we start there, Jim and Laura. I mean, um, you want to just give people a feel for how you got caught up in it or how sure. it, it just originated? Well, the first thing, the first thing I like to do is just uh, thank the New England College Basketball Hall of Fame uh, Mr. Rod Steyer, Dan Doyle, Jim Nelson for having us here. It, when I was sitting in the second row, it dawned on me that this is a situation that uh, had been conceived 37 years ago that I found myself involved in. And this is the first time, 37 years later, that I've ever spoken publicly about it. Now I realize, less than a year ago, my wife and I were both featured on ESPN's 30 for 30 playing for the mob. But uh, we've lived in Florida for close to 32 years. No one, except ESPN about two years ago, ever reached out to us and said, would you like to tell your side of the story? So I'm very grateful this, for this opportunity. I'm honored to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And uh, I'm also excited to be able to share some things that uh, never really made it to the media that uh, have colored uh, my life personally over the years. So to Rick's question, how did I find myself involved in it? It's not something that I was looking, looking to find. Uh, I wasn't uh, like the main conspirator. I wasn't the guy that actually you know, drew up the plan. I was invited to dinner to meet people that I had not known uh, by a college teammate by the name of Rick Kuhn, who I liked and I trusted. And uh, I actually went to this dinner at the Logan Airport Hilton, and at my very strong-willed mother's uh, behest, I had taken a Whitman sampler of six chocolates, going to meet people, one of whom was Henry Hill, who is one of the most, uh, I guess, glorified, if you can use that term, uh, mobsters in the history of America. But who would have known at that time, the gentleman that you know I was not expecting to meet, was uh, the person who had turned out to be, you know, the star or the reason for the movie Goodfellas. So, you know, to answer your question, it's not something that I looked for, it's something that I found myself embroiled. I think it's really important to, to mention to everybody that Jim, uh, Jim was never charged in the case. Jim was never offered immunity or accepted immunity to testify. Uh, he was one of three key witnesses. Um, that were involved in the case. Uh, he mentions Henry Hill. Well, Henry Hill was supposedly tied to the Lucchese crime family in New York. And where the story got interesting, and it's, it's kind of evolved over the decades, but um, Henry Hill was tied with a crime family that they thought was implement, uh, implicated in a $6 million theft uh, at uh, Lufthansa in New York. So it's all interwoven, it's an interesting, situation it's it's too long and in, in, in uh, probably detailed for us to cover but um jim yeah obviously i'd like to go back and change some things but you know you can't do that you can't replay the clock in life uh as far as your question do i have any bitterness or animosity am i angry no um and people you know when they've asked me that question in the past they said well how can you not be bitter how can you not be angry and i said you know, I had a decision to make. I made the wrong decision at the time. I could have done things differently. 
Today, I don't know what they would be as far as doing things differently, but it was a decision that I made. Sure, I was a kid at the time, but you know, I still had common sense. I was raised a certain way, and I chose to do something that has followed me for the rest of my life, 37 years later. So uh, if, if I'm gonna be bitter at anybody, it sh or angry, it should be at myself. But I never beat myself up over it because I know that I was the one that made the decision. I found myself in that situation. You know, sure, I could have done things differently, but I didn't. And I have had a phenomenal life. I mean, look at the lady that's sitting next to me. I mean, we've been together, you know, going on 38 years now. So I have absolutely no regrets. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. And I'm smiling as I say this because I, I really mean it. Feel angry. I think a lot of people would have assumed Jimmy was angry. And I have to say, I found the whole thing so shocking when I learned about it. But never in all these years, including with the Sports Illustrated article that painted Jimmy as some thug, um, I never once heard him complain. He just continued playing ball. He was smiling. He went along with life. And he never, ever turned himself into any kind of a victim, ever. So that was that. Now you're back to your question again about me. What? What was your question for me? How well, when we got married? You find yourself, it's tough enough to be a newlywed, I think, for both of you probably. And then on top of that, you've got this case. Um, you, sorted characters involved, media. Um, I mean, give the people an idea. Of, how, how that was. Funny you should ask about this. I knew some of the parties. I didn't know Henry Hill from when we were in college, and some of them that were depicted in the film were actually quite nice people. I liked them, not knowing that there was an ulterior motive. I learned about this before we got married. It was the very day that the FBI came inquiring with Jimmy about what took place. We got married several months later, but I had been in law school at the time. And of course, it had become a media story. And one of the professors said to me, are they speaking about your fiance? And I said, yes, that's him. And he said, well, who's representing him? And I said, well, no one's representing him. He's a, he's a witness. And he just looked at me like I, you know, like I just grew up yesterday. He said, Maura, you tell your fiance he better get some representation. You can't trust anyone. So what the one thing I will remember is when we did get married, we never announced our wedding because we were advised um, that it would turn into a media frenzy. So we got married, we had a fine time, but beyond that, we did have two threats. Jim, you mentioned the SI story. I wish you know, Sports Illustrated would have reached out to me. They never did. They didn't reach out to me. They didn't re reach out to my mother or father, you know, my sister. Uh, yeah, there was no communication whatsoever. So I, I was actually coming back from work. Uh, and this is the pre-cell phone era, uh, you know, <laughs> So people couldn't contact me by cell phone. It wasn't until I had gotten home, you know, the phone, I, I noticed that there were so many messages. And I found out that day that it was the lead story, February 16th, 1981. Not that anybody was keeping track, but uh, uh, that there was a story written about the, the VC point shaving scandal, but it painted me in a very negative light. And I'm Uh, first of all, as far as Ernie uh, getting indicted, I never had one conversation with Ernie you know, concerning what was going on. Uh, the first time we had ever spoken with, about it was a few months ago. And we spoke at length a couple times. And you know, I respected the fact that uh, you know, he looked to clear his name, and, and he did. Um, as far as taking the money, uh, it was interesting. I never really needed money when I was in college. Um, there was another thing I provided ESPN 30 for 30 for the documentary were copies of letters I was writing to my wife who was at the time studying in Spain. I was working for $3.15 an hour and I had actually, you know, the, the documentation to show that's how much I was making in 1978 and 79. Uh, plus, my mother used to send me $25 a week, and I provided all of that information to the FBI because every week she would send me 25 bucks, and I would deposit $15 like clockwork into my bank book at the local bank near campus. So the $500 in question is I was offered money by Henry Hill, by the Perlas. I, always re I rejected it. Uh, Rick Kuhn had been paid some money and he caught me alone in the BC basketball locker room and he said, you gotta go along with this. He says, you're gonna get me killed and you're gonna get you killed. 
And, and I said, I'm not going along with it. And he said, you're involved with it, whether you like it or not, whether you think uh, you're involved or not. And he had, as I said on the documentary, five $100 bills. He crinkled up, he pushed it into my chest. I didn't, like, didn't hold it, didn't grab it. I just let it fall to the floor. He did an about face, walked out of the locker room. So I picked it up and I, I held on to it for months. I actually confided with two of my college roommates, one of whom you had probably seen on the documentary, and I asked for their advice what to do. Was it a mistake on my part? Huge mistake. However, as I've shared uh, you know, with the people at ESPN that never got on film, it was a perfect storm that I had found myself in in life, and the storm was ready to crush me. And I loved BC. You know, I was fortunate. I was there on a scholarship. Our team was on the rise. We were really good. I didn't want to leave, but I found myself in a contentious relationship with a coach who did not recruit me, who wanted me gone. And this was, ironically, before my junior year, which was my big breakout year at BC. And then I got a better year my senior year. So it's not as if I had the $500 and I could go and take it to my coach and say, look at this. This is what I found myself involved in because I knew that he wanted me out. He didn't think I could play. And but thanks to Dr. Tom Davis, I became a better player because he so fueled my inner man to be a better player. Can I comment sure. here? I think this might be. You think we had the, air, <laughs> the microphone downstairs as well. This might be a good place where I could add a little color. Jimmy and I did not meet until our sophomore year at college. I knew nothing about basketball. I lived in the in the library, and I remember. One of the first conversations I had with Jimmy, he was telling me that his, there was a brand new coach that came in that year, and that during his first meeting with the coach, the coach wanted his scholarship. And then a few times, Jimmy said to me after his class, he said, you want to meet me after, after practice or whatever? I sat at a few practices and I watched what was going on there, and it was so shocking and so appalling to me. Now granted, I'm not, I don't have an athletic background, but one day I saw Coach Davis so ridicule one of the players, it wasn't Jimmy, that the poor guy ended up breaking down in tears. And there was something in him, in the coach, that really sort of liked to go these kids on. And I said, Jimmy, I'm sorry, I can't go anymore to watch this. And secondly, the pressure continued on Jimmy. And I would hear about it through certain conversations. And I said to him one day, and I never forgot this, we were just newly dating at the time. I said, now picture this, the person that knows nothing about athlete, athletics. I said, Jimmy, I cannot believe that a coach would be treating me that way. Why don't you just quit? And he said to me, Maura, he said, number one, I'm on scholarship. I don't play, I don't get a degree. My parents cannot afford to send me to college. But he said, beyond that, I don't want to go to any other college. I expect to play here at BC, because that was one of the things Coach Davis said. And I, I remember at that point, I thought, boy, Jimmy, he's such a nice guy, but boy, I could feel that strength of character, like, don't even question me on this. Well, that was so important, because when it came time for later on, when Jimmy had that money, is that for Jimmy to ever mention that he had that money to his coach, who for a few years never wanted Jimmy there, he would have been out like that. Mm. Well, I think that's a good point because uh, people should know you weren't recruited by that staff. You were recruited by Coach Bob Zuffalata. Yes. And uh, I think those are scenarios that many players find themselves in when there's a coaching change. Um, I talked to Kevin Mackey, a longtime assistant, uh, a great guy. Uh, native of uh, Somerville, Mass., long-time hoop, hoop fanatic. Uh. It was an interesting uh, moment in time as far as uh, teammates, as well as staff, because it was an old regime replaced by a new regime. It was guys recruited by one coach and then new players coming in. Uh, not only was there friction and you know, tension amongst the players, but I sensed that there was friction and tension, uh, tension amongst the coaching staff. And it wasn't the most pleasant environment to be around. However, I'm grateful for it. I mean, I, I look back on my experience at BC and even what we walked through, uh, I feel like uh, my wife and I are about to enter or walk into a new chapter in life. And we will never, would never be able to do what we know we're going to be doing uh, in life if we didn't walk through like a dark time or a time that really caused us to mature 
and to steal us as individuals. So, you know, I could look back on this thing and say, man, this was just absolutely awful. Uh, you know, I regret it, you know, I'm bitter. But, you know, that would only kill you. That would kill me. And, I mean, I, so hopefully I answered your question. In the interest of the time, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. Great. Uh, for sure. Some Quietly successful computer sales company in Florida for many years. We went cold turkey a few years ago and said we want to do something with impact and import. And we went cold turkey, you know, with the computer business and uh, looked to exercise our creative bent. And I created a cartoon character by the name of Mike. I call him the ultimate talking head on sports. Mike is a microphone, and he's a witty, creative, outside the box, little impish. You know, character that is animated. I have a Mike on Sports podcast. I've written 37 Mike Sports comic books. And as of this morning, I, pwn, I, I penned the blog knowing I'd be in New England. And it's called Boston's Favorite Fictional Sports Character, Sam Malone from Cheers. And I've written 741 blogs. To your point, it's doing well as far as we're concerned. Hopefully, one day you'll see him on ESPN or Fox or NBC Sports. And I love what I do. Okay, let's uh, get some questions. Yeah. I just want to say, uh, my, my name is Mark Clyde. You made a mistake uh, in your words. You used, I think you actually used the word mistake. I haven't seen that in what I know about you at all. Maybe I could have had a better choice of words. No, it sounded like you made a mistake. I think you used that word. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, I did. Well, what, all right, maybe, you know what, that's a very good question. I was listening to the same thing. Explain to everybody what your mistake was yeah, that you referenced. I, I don't have the answer for it. Uh, I know the way things have, you know, worked out uh, as far as how things were reported to the media. For uh, the conversation, uh, Rick, uh, Jim, and Mara will be uh, here for the rest of the afternoon. And the